the school of Dignaga is a school that really uh, is is loosely affiliated um, in in the sense that uh, it's not a specific school that uh, necessarily rejects others, but it's actually a school that focuses on uh, epistemology in the Buddhist tradition, and it can be used by any number of of Buddhist schools. So the founder of this is known as Dignaga, who lived roughly 480 to 540. Uh, in the common era. Uh, the school has come to be known as Yogacara Sautrantika. It's not, you know, unlike other schools like maybe Abhidharma or Madhyamaka, Yogacara Sautrantika is not um, concerned with articulating uh, some path to Nirvana. Instead, it's concerned with developing philosophical tools that can be useful to uh, people following various paths. So it can be useful to the Madhyamakas, to the Abhidharmas, to the Yogacaras, uh, and so on. And the reason is that the difference is they're not so focused on uh, describing the ultimate nature of reality, but instead they're focused on means of knowledge, of which then different schools that are focused on describing the nature of reality um, could use. So I want to first... Uh, look at the basic Nyaya Pramanas, right? So those uh, means of knowledge that the Nyaya Hindu school accepts. So, and, and again, the reason is because Nyaya is kind of one of the traditional uh, adversaries of, of Buddhism. So Nyaya argues that we have knowledge through four different ways. Perception, inference, comparison, and testimony. Now, they argue that any object can be known with any of the pramanas, meaning any object in the same way. That if I'm perceiving, let's say, a fire, right? The object of fire, I'm, I, I, I have knowledge of the same exact fire, whether I'm perceiving it with my eyes, whether I infer the fire because I see smoke uh, um, that's coming from behind a hill, or, or uh, anything else. And their argument for just to focus on perception and inference is that perceptual cognition is direct. So one sense of vision comes into contact with the object. That is, I uh, see the fire because um, perhaps light rays bounce off into my eyes, and so I, I am directly witnessing and, and therefore has direct knowledge of the fire before me. When I infer the fire, like because there's smoke rising behind a hill, my cognition is indirect. What happens is that I end up perceiving the sign of the presence of the object being fire. So I see the sign, which is the smoke, which refers to a fire. But that doesn't mean I only actually have knowledge of the smoke. I have knowledge of the same fire just through a different means, an indirect means. But crucially, again, their argument is it doesn't matter by which pramana, we have knowledge of the exact same object. Buddhism disagrees. First, they argue that we only have knowledge through two means, perception or inference. And each means of knowledge cognizes its own distinctive object. That is, when I perceive, for example, a fire, I am perceiving that fire as opposed to when I infer that there's a fire, I'm actually inferring something different, not the fire itself, not the same object that is being perceived. So when I perceive something, I'm perceiving something as a real particular, a distinct thing. So when I, when I, when I perceive uh, the fire, I'm cognizing a particular mental image of a thing that is a fire. And it is something that is vivid, right? In the same way that, like, let's say I perceive the heat of uh, the flame from a lighter if I have a lighter and I hold it under my, my hand, right? Now... My experiencing of the flame under my hand is going to be more vivid, right? I mean, the reaction is going to be much greater than if I infer that, um, you know, it, it hurts to have uh, uh, hold a, li a lit lighter under my hand, right? So if I um, think like, okay, a lighter makes a fire, I know that fire hurts, my experiencing of the inference of uh, a lit lighter under my hand hurting is less vivid. And we know this due to the fact that my reaction is going to be less intense. And the reason that uh, this is, 
uh, Yogacara Santrantika argues is that what is cognized through inference is actually an abstract image of a more particular image. So in this case, being fire, that when I infer that the the you know the flame would hurt from the lighter under my hand, even though I'm not doing it and I haven't done it before, let's say. I am actually cognizing the an abstraction of a particular instance of, uh, you know, maybe um, seeing fire, right? So again, unlike Nyaya, so Nyaya thinks that I'm having knowledge when I infer that the flame would hurt holding the lighter under my hand. I have knowledge of the exact same thing as if I were to hold the lighter under my hand. Buddhism is saying your knowledge of actually holding a lighter under your hand and perceiving it and inferring right what would happen is different because this involves abstraction it involves taking particulars and putting them together to make sense of them and that by putting them together is something that is less particular and therefore you have knowledge of something different but the reason though we can say that we i still have knowledge of like the the flame you know under my hand hurting from the lighter is because it's it's, it's successful in practice right if um if I try to infer that the flame would hurt and, and that actually never happened, then we could say that's an unsuccessful inference. And by that means of inference, I don't actually have knowledge of, you know, the, the flame hurting from holding it under my hand. So for Buddhism, something is a means of knowledge only if it invariably leads to successful practice. And we can say anything which allows us to uh, come to or anything that is successful by means of perception or inference is a uh, um, a means of knowledge. So Buddhism, right? When they're saying we perceive uh, distinct particulars, like the flame, it's it's a distinct uh, object I'm experiencing. This is because, again, Buddhists are nominalists, right? They think all that exists are particulars. Universals don't exist. So Nyaya argues that we have knowledge of the same object, whether I perceive or infer the object, regardless of the means, because the uh, universals, substances of like fireness, for example, exists. Or we can take the example of, uh, let's say there are three different cows and they have three different names, uh, perhaps Flossie, Bossy, and Daisy. Right, I am able to perceive Flossy, Bossy, and Daisy, and know that they're all three of them are cows, even though they're distinct cows, because Nyaya argues there's a certain cowness that exists in them. Now, there's an argument, of course, um, against this uh, that Abhidharma Buddhism makes. Buddhism, though, in general, including the Abhidharmas, right? They argue that there are no such things as universals. There's no such thing as this cowness that exists or this fireness that exists in each particular fire that allows us to know that all the particular instances of fire are really of one whole, which is called fire. So what Buddhism argues is that when we think of universals like a fire, you know, or when we refer to a particular instance of something like a fire or this here as a mug, even though they're many different distinct kinds of mugs or cups or whatever else right this is a mere name a conceptual designation right and there is no such thing as a, a mug or a fire or a cow that exists independent of the mind ascribing right the label to these particulars now there is a bit of a distinction though in buddhism where abhidharma argues that there are ultimately real particulars right there are dharmas the difference is that Yogacara Satrantika, the, the school of Dignaga, argues that ultimately real things, which are particulars like the particular flame I, I can perceive, these are actually so perfectly unique that they are indescribable. Because of this, when I actually try to um, describe the particular experience of, let's say, like this distinct cup, I end up falsifying it. The only way I can make sense of this cup is to ascribe certain properties that I ascribe to other things as well. And because of that, uh, I can never actually describe the uniqueness of this cup as it truly uh, uh, perhaps exists. Now, they do give uh, an actually uh, concise argument for why there are no universals. So the first premise is that only what is causally efficacious is real. 
And the reason is that, well, only those things uh, which are, are um, effects from causes or those things which are causes of other effects are real things because nothing can be real if it's not produced by something else, if it doesn't come into existence. Now, the second premise is that to be causally efficacious is to produce an effect at a particular time. So, to be causally effic efficacious is, of course, to uh, uh, produce an effect. And if you don't produce an effect at a particular time, you can't be causally efficacious. You can't be a cause at all. The third premise, something eternal would be unchanging. If there was something eternal, it would have never have come about due to a cause because it would have had to exist prior to that cause. Fourth premise, there would be no reason for an unchanging thing to produce an effect at any one time and not another. The reason, of, of course, is that, well, if there, uh, uh, you know, if there's something that exists and it doesn't produce effects, um, then it's unsure why it would be something uh, that actually exists at all because all things that come into existence are the products of causes. So there's no reason why then something, if it comes to exist, wouldn't also therefore produce effects and it would just, you know, stay subsisting in the same state, you know, perhaps statically uh, throughout time. So the fifth, fifth premise is that nothing eternal therefore could be causally efficacious. If nothing eternal can be causally efficacious, then there are no existing things that are eternal. So therefore, there are no universals. There are no things like fire that exists in a bunch of different particulars, which is why we can uh, uh, refer to the different particulars as being one universal thing, fire, or one universal thing, Austin, or another universal thing, mug, or mugs, you know, in the plural, right? Uh, denoting that, that all the particular mugs are actually of one kind of thing, mug in general, right? Now, again, mug in general, it works. It works to talk about mugs in general. But that doesn't mean they actually exist. It's a conceptual label the mind puts on these things. So all universals are actually mind dependent. They don't actually exist outside of our own conceptual capacities to create these labels for, again, useful purposes. Now, what does that mean specifically about perception then? Because again, remember, the argument was that, well, when we perceive things, we perceive particulars. I'm perceiving this particular bug here. So if there are no universals, why do we seem able to express our perceptual experiences and language if to, to describe this mug as it exists in its particularity would be to falsify it, right? How do I make sense that this is a mug then? Well, the argument is that when I have knowledge that this is a mug, it's not actually through perception, it's through perceptual judgment. So it's a qualification of perception. So. Uh, perceptual judgment involves, um, or it's where uh, uh, knowing what word, like for example, this is a mug, knowing to call this a mug involves actually an inferential process or something like an inferential process. So how this works is that first, there's a non-conceptual cognition of a unique, a, a unique particular. So there is just a mere perception. So there's a perception that is non-conceptual of, of this mug, although the fact that I've already called it a mug means it's a, a perceptual judgment. But there's originally a, just a, a, a perception that, that is um, non-conceptual. Secondly, there's an unconscious inference whereby what is seen, this particular in itself, this unique particular, which is unlike anything else, is judged on the basis of other particulars that have been already non-conceptually cognized or this involves, therefore, conceptualization. What that means is I've already experienced certain particulars that over time I've come to denote as being mugs. So when I perceive this particular mug, my mind unconsciously already involves an inferential process using or depending upon, you know, perception, where therefore I judge that what I'm perceiving is a mug. So, I never actually have knowledge of the direct perception. I have knowledge uh, uh, of the uh, mug that I'm perceiving because I judge it to be a mug. Because I've already undergone an unconscious uh, inferential process of conceptualizing it to be a mug. Uh, 
uh, and this is instant, right? And it relies on uh, habit. So I have to already precede the bunch of particulars first, right? And this is something that we do as children. As children, um, you know, I uh, uh, if we only, for example, ever experienced, um, well, I mean, think of it this way, right? With the pandemic and having to wear masks, if you were born at the beginning of, let's say, the pandemic, right? And let's say you only ever went outside wearing a mask, okay? You would only know that uh, um, existence outside of the household involves wearing masks because that's all that you would have perceived. So you would never perceive someone else wearing, um, you know, not wearing a mask as like, let's say like, you know, something that's right to do because your perception of someone and whether or not they wear a mask, you judge that perception of the person perhaps not wearing the mask if you were a two-year-old to be something bad, something not right, because all you've known, right, your, your judgment based on the perception depends on your past experiences. Now, what that means, though, is that perception, because it is non-conceptual, no, so not perceptual judgment, but just mere perception is non-conceptual, it does not lead to successful practice. And that's why we, you know, through mere perception, can't say that we have, I have knowledge of this mug, because if I can't describe it, then it's not useful. So things perceived must be conceptualized. They must involve inferential reasoning for me to have knowledge of the object. So let's look a bit closer at inference. So again, a belief can only be said to be true if it leads to successful practice. Well, successful inferences have what they call the presence of the triple mark. The triple mark is first, there's something which is the subject of inference. Let's say again, perhaps this mug or fire. Secondly, that object can only be, uh, or that object must only be present when the property or the sadia to be proven is present. And uh, it can never be the case that um, uh, um, a mug can be present when the particular mug, perhaps, or the sign referring to the mug is not there. So let's say it's always the case that, like, when I uh, come into my office here, um, there's a coffee cup. And there's always a coffee cup when there's a mug around. Now, let's say I come into my office. I don't perhaps see my desk because, let's say, or I, sorry, I don't see my mug on my desk because, let's say, I left it somewhere else. But if I see the coffee cup, because I have always had the coffee cup and the mug around, you know, associated together, I can infer the coffee cup must be around. Now, uh, um, what that requires is one, a coffee cup, the subject of inference, uh, two, or, or a coffee cup being around, two, um, the fact that the coffee cup is there, and therefore I can infer the mug must be there. But it can't be the case that I can infer the mug is there when the coffee cup is not there. Because then the inference of the coffee cup wouldn't depend on this as a sign at all. Another example, perhaps uh, easier to understand, is that because one, there's smoke on the mountain, which is the subject of inference. Two, smoke is only present when there's a fire. So that's uh, 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 only being present when the property to be proven is present. And three, smoke is never present where there is no fire, so my belief that there is fire on the hill is correct. This is how inference works according to Yogacara Sajrantika. Okay. We might still wonder then, okay, if it's the case that, you know, uh, uh, um, we perceive particulars, but we don't actually have knowledge of the particular. It involves an inferential process where, again, what I actually have knowledge of is not the particular itself, but uh, an abstract, perhaps, image of the particular, right, that the mind constructs. We might ask, how can there be any successful practice with respect to the real things we perceive if these are unique particulars? How can it be the case that if I never actually... Uh, uh, have knowledge of, of, of the direct or, or um, of the particular object itself, it would seem like I'm just living in a fantasy, a completely, you know, uh, uh, constructed reality, 
how can it be the case that anything is successful? It just seems like uh, it would be far too subjective, perhaps. So what we're looking for here is a, uh, a theory of language. The theory developed by Dignaga is known as Apoha, or the theory of Apoha. Apoha means exclusion. And the argument is that the meaning of a word is the exclusion of the other. So the meaning of mug, for example, depends on the exclusion of all other things that are not mugs. And that's how I can refer to this as being a, a mug. Because I don't have knowledge of the mug, I have knowledge of, as we'll see, uh, uh, um, things that are not, uh, or I have knowledge of things that are not here that are not mugs. So, if everything is unique, again, and, and so uh, perception involves um, uh, 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 experiencing of a particular like this mug, then the nature of a particular is just its difference from everything else. So... We know how to use the word fire, for example, if we can distinguish between the things that are called fire and the things that are not called fire. I know how to distinguish between a mug and a cup if I know how to actually use the two different things, right? A mug has a little handle here, doesn't have a top. This coffee cup here has a top, it doesn't have a handle. And I know in different cases, like I can perhaps walk a little faster with this because it has a, a top than I can, for example, with the mug. And so how I also might drink these is different. Whereas this has a hole, the mug doesn't have a hole. Now, there might be an objection, perhaps from like a nyayika. They might ask, how do we know what, for example, non-fires are or non-mugs are? Wouldn't we need knowledge of what everything else then is? If we need knowledge of what everything else is, because if it's not the case that I actually have knowledge of uh, this particular mug and that's how I know what the mug is, but it's because I have knowledge of all the other things that aren't mugs, then it would seem that I would need to have knowledge, right, of everything else. Of, of I would need to have knowledge of phones, of, of shirts, of persons and so on to determine that this is not a person, this is not a shirt, this is not a phone, and so on. Well, it would seem that my knowledge of this depends on having knowledge of everything else, and I would also have to have knowledge of what knowledge is. And it would seem that then I would have to have, no if I have to have knowledge of what knowledge is, it would be a circular argument. That would be fallacious, right? So it seems like um, Dignaga's argument here uh, about the meaning of words does not make sense. How we can make sense of, 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 you know, the reference of what we use, like a mug, for example. The response is that what we do when we actually um, uh, 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 claim or judge, you know, that this is a mug, for example, is that we project our interests onto the world. What we do is that, again, this is almost a, a pragmatic argument here that's being put forward by Dignaga. That what we do is we learn the differences of things as we go. We try to fit things into a certain pattern with success or failure. We overlook individual differences in so doing, right? And we learn to see all things as alike. Like, again, I, I don't have a bunch of mugs with me here right now, right? But if I did, I would say, look... I learned to, to see that all these things are, are mugs. And if at one point in time it didn't work, then I would fail and I would have to revise my understanding of what a mug is. Right? And the reason is because over time, by overlooking the individual differences of the different particulars of different mugs, I, and, and you know learning to see them as alike, I end up uh, seeing them as a group that stands over against all the other things that don't satisfy the desire of, for example, holding coffee, which I can drink, while I record a lecture video. Now, of course, what that means is all of our words and how we make subject to, uh, or how we make sense of things is subject to error. But what it means is it's always a process open to revision. It's an ongoing perpetual process that never ends. It requires experience. So, um, uh, the Buddhist Kamala Sila actually um, gives a, a response to this objection. So, Kamala Sila says, Though there be no universal, 
it is still determinant in accordance with a rule pertaining to universal terms that when there is the performing by many of a single function, though many, some things by their nature all perform one function. So in order to express their capacity for a single function, so a single function that all mugs serve, which is to have a handle of which you can hold hot stuff like coffee or hot chocolate or tea in and drink, for example, uh, what happens is there's an imposition of a single form for the sake of making things lighter for agents or easier. So therefore, a single word is applied to these things like mug. As the word pot, for example, is applied to what have many colors, etc., when they have the capacity to fulfill the definitive function of holding perhaps honey, water, and so on. So uh, to recap here, or to give a, a further summary, right, of, of uh, a POHA theory, we don't have knowledge of X because of X. I don't have knowledge of this mug because of, of the mug itself. Because again, we can't describe the particular mug. It is unique. And if we use anything else like the fact that this cup holds liquids to, to help make sense of this mug and to describe this mug, I actually do a disservice to the particularity of this mug and I falsify the particularity of the mug. I can never describe it in its uniqueness. So I have knowledge of this mug because this mug is not, okay, it is not a, um, uh, 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 um, it is not a non um, mug. What that means is I don't have knowledge of the mug because it's not a phone. Because we would want to ask then, okay, well, how do you have knowledge of what a phone is to know that this is not a phone? That's not the case. I have knowledge that this is not things that are not mugs. How? Because of use. Because of my experience with using mugs. That it fits the description of what I take to be a mug. That doesn't mean that I have knowledge of this being, you know, a particular mug. So, another example. My knowledge that if I'm, you know, perceiving a fire is that I can infer perhaps that the particulars I'm experiencing are not things that are not fire because my understanding of a fire involves perhaps burning things and my understanding of a phone does not involve burning things. So I am actually, um, I, I, can, I can say that I have knowledge that what is in front of me is a fire. Let's say I'm at like at a bonfire, right? I can say I have knowledge that this is a fire because what it's doing is things that are not associated with things that are not fires. Now, again, this only works if, it, if it's useful, if it's conventional. So for convenience, and the, you know, I mean, in the same way, going back to the arguments about uh, why we can say there are chariots or there are persons, we do so because... Uh, um, it, it works, right? I can say I am Austin or I'm a person because it works to say so, but that doesn't mean that I actually, Austin, exist. So for convenience, we conceptualize experiences with labels as if we have knowledge of the thing itself, but that doesn't actually mean we have knowledge of the thing itself, and it's always subject to revision. We can be proven wrong about uh, what we, what we, uh, um, uh, what our, 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 um, knowledge is in the future. So conceptual images are also actually particulars. So when I, when I have this conceptual image of like what a mug is, for example, that image is itself a particular because it is unique. And the only way that I make sense of what a mug is, is also through the same inferential process that happens when I perceive the particular mug itself as well. So even the conceptual labels are not themselves, um, uh, um, they're not themselves uh, different from the, the particulars that I experience either. Now, finally, how then if, you know, of course, when I talk about a mug, there's no real thing that's a mug. How is it that we can talk about unreal things? I mean, how could we, for example, because we do, we talk about unicorns. We talk about Santa Claus. How can we talk about these things if we don't exist at all? Now, Nyaya argues that we only talk about what is real because meaning requires reference to real entities. So they would argue that unicorns and Santa Claus aren't real 
but we can still talk about them because they're based on substances that are real, right? So a unicorn involves uh, the fact that horses are real or, or horns are real, and then our mind can put those together to make up something that isn't real. But they refer to things that are actually real. The same thing with Santa Claus involving snow, beards, persons, uh, and snow, and, and so on. The difference is that what Buddhism is arguing is not that, um, you know, Buddhism is not arguing that um, when I come up, or, or when I identify this as being a mug, that the mug is not real, and it's entirely, you know, the label is entirely fanciful in the same way that like a unicorn or a Santa Claus isn't real, but that they're all not real. Because they're just useful uh, labels that we apply to uh, um, a, an aggregate of particulars. So Buddhism argues that the object of our, con uh, our cognition is not something that is ultimately real, right? It's a kind of useful fiction in general. So unicorns and Santa Claus aren't real, but neither are the supposedly perceived substances that are used to create the fiction. The reason, though, that we can say that uh, uh, we can refer to a mug, even though the mug isn't real, is because it works, and it works because it satisfies desires. Because, again, this comes back to uh, uh, it being a conventional truth. So our desires cause us to think that our conceptual fictions are ultimately real. This goes back to the belief in a self. Our desires cause us to believe that there is a self. Even though ultimately there is not a self. The self is just uh, an aggregate of parts. So, for example, there's an ultimately real, indescribable particular that is behind my desire for warmth that I obtain when I correctly judge that there's a fire. So what happens is I end up thinking fire in general as a kind of universal is real. The problem is Fire, uh, uh, in general, as a kind of universal, is not real. It's a mere conceptual label, right? And this is how, again, Buddhism argues that we make sense of things that are not ultimately real, like persons, like mugs, and so on. But we can still say we have knowledge of mugs because it works. And we have knowledge not, again, to be even clear, we have knowledge not of the mug itself, we have knowledge of the fact that the mug, or my experience of this, is an experience of something that is not something that is a non-mug. Because it performs the functions of what I take to be a mug. Or it doesn't, for example, perform the function of what I take to be a phone. And it doesn't require me to have knowledge of phones in particular, or mugs in particular. All it requires is that it works.